What's up, good people? Mark Holmes here, and as always, I want to say thank you all for watching, commenting, subscribing, and being part of the Joe Boo Sports Report. Without you guys, as well as you ladies, you know that this literally does not work. Hope everybody's having a great day. It is hump day, and I've got a little bit of a cold. Forgive me here. Um, apologize. Last night, I did not do a end of the evening uh, fireside chat. I was exhausted. I'm down working on the red brick house. Um, we got a reinspections tomorrow and trying to get that stuff done. And I think just the whole draft trip and the drive and everything else had finally caught up with me. And I just literally just fell out last night. Um, it was kind of crazy because my wife came to bed and I was like, I still got to do a video. She's like, yeah, sure you do. But anyway, I got a good night's rest. Um, I'm excited about going back over and working on the Red Brick House. And, you know, I'm going through still the draft. I, I still keep pinching myself because I don't believe that the Dallas Cowboys actually drafted an interior defensive lineman. If you've been a follower of the Joe Blue Sports Report, you know how much I have been talking about the offensive line. I mean, excuse me, the defensive line and how important it is. Unfortunately, people don't think about the big nasties. They don't show them love. Now, see, I played at JMU on nose guard. Dan Quinn played nose guard in college. Yeah, believe it or not, he did. Dan Quinn's not a big guy. Neither am I. And it's a hard position. And you get no love. You get no glory. But there's no more key position on the field. I know you're going to say, man, you're crazy. That cornerback is, is the guy. Man, that linebacker is that edge rusher. But see, everything starts right there from the middle. And it makes all the difference in the world. And this is the problem with the Dallas Cowboys is we've not had great interior defensive line play in since 2007, 8, 9, and 10. And that's when Jay Ratcliffe was here. Now, remember when I was going up to, uh, driving up to the draft, I uh, saw Brian uh, Baldinger was basically saying, if the Cowboys had good interior defensive play, that Micah Parsons would have 20 sacks. And I said, tell me something else. You know, I don't know Captain Obvious. I've been saying that for years. You know, I wanted to get my man Calais Campbell years ago and things. You know, I remember having discussions with Bosch Lombardi and, and with Law Nation and trying to understand why the Dallas Cowboys have this aversion to one technique guys. But here is the proof right here. Because, see, here's what's funny. This is what's so funny to me is because... Um, I had Eagles trolls coming through the live stream on Sunday that were saying, oh man, this guy, ah, he doesn't have any sacks. He sucks. And if you look at the numbers of a nose tackle, you know, uh, typically you'll see, you know, maybe 25, 30 tackles, maybe two or three sacks. And as a person who does fantasy football, you look at that and say, man, that ain't getting me no points. That guy sucks. If you're equating a nose tackle to edge rusher statistics, then you don't understand football. Because there's a big difference between statistics that you get from an edge rusher. Typically, an edge rusher might have 10, 15 sacks, but he might only have about 30, 40 tackles. As opposed to a linebacker, linebacker may have 100, 140 Tackles, or in case of Bobby Wagner, like 155 tackles and three or four sacks. Each position has different roles that they must play. So here's the thing. Brian Baldinger is 100% right. And I can point to exact situation here with the Dallas Cowboys. If we go through and look at... Jay Radcliffe was probably the last really great nose tackle we had. And he was great for four years. 2008, he had seven and a half sacks, which for a nose tackle is incredible. 51 tackles, okay? Pro Bowl season, okay? Um, the next year, um, six sacks, 40 combined tackles, Pro Bowl and all pro, all pro, okay? 2010. Another Pro Bowl season, 
31 tackles, 3.5 sacks. 2011, 2 sacks, 38 tackles. Now, quite frankly, you look at that, again, if you don't understand the role of a nose tackle, you look at those numbers and say, best season was 7.5 sacks and that was a Pro Bowl season? Yeah, that's outstanding for a nose tackle. Because what it does is, here, here's the role of a nose tackle. You are the center of the defense. You might shade a little to the left. You might shade a little to the right. Sometimes you might be in the gap. But your role is to clog up the middle. You are the point of attack. You're going to get hit from every single direction by everybody. If you're a tackle, a right tackle or a left tackle, pretty much everything's coming from one side. If you're a defensive end, everything is inside of you. As a nose tackle, your head better be like an exorcist where you can do a whole 360 because you line up on the center and it's and you get hangry too because the football is right here and you never get to touch it. It's right there. Every single play teasing you. You want to pick up that football. You want to have that glory. But it's right there saying, ha ha. It's literally laughing at you. Your helmet is this far away from the next guy's helmet. You got both hands in the dirt. But it's not just that guy right there. Because you get combo blocked. Double team. This guy, the guard, he's hitting you in the hip. While this guy's hitting you in the face. And your job is to stay right there. Split the double team and clog up the middle. So the linebackers can get the tackles and pass and passes. Your job push the pocket so the edge rushers can get the tackles. And, of course, stopping the run. If you do your job, everybody's job is easier on the defense. And I mean everybody's. Because edge rushers, their job is to get upfield. Upfield. If the quarterback can step up, they can get washed right by. But if you do your job in the middle and that quarterback can't step up, that target, boom, the edge rusher is going to get them every time. If you do your job, and can hold the double team so that way the guard doesn't get off to the linebacker, then the linebacker's not getting hit. He can see unmolested which hole the running back's going and fill. He can scrape. He's going to that point of attack. He's making the plays. He's not having to get rid of a guy and then get there. It's easier for him. And if you do your job, you clog up the middle, pass coverage, the quarterback if you're like an eclipse, like Mozzie is, yeah, he's an eclipse. Six foot three, 333 pounds. Yeah. You get up there and get your paws up there. The quarterback doesn't have a clear view of the middle of the field. He might have to sidearm Sally the passes. He may have to move around. He may have to try and spin around. If he spins around trying to get, get away, that's when the edge rushers get him. So... That makes it harder for the quarterback. And if you do your job, that quarterback's not going to be comfortable, which helps out the cornerbacks because, well, it's less time he has to throw, less time for receivers to get open. Now, here's the thing. So I talked about 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, those seasons of Jay Ratcliffe being on the Dallas Cowboys defense, right? Four years that he was a pro bowler. Now check this out. DeMarcus Ware. This is where this puts it all together. DeMarcus Ware, 2008, 20 sacks, all pro. 2009, um, all pro, 11 sacks. 2010, 15.5 sacks, pro bowl. 2011, 19 and 19.5 sacks. Boom. Four years of Jay Ratcliffe playing great. 
four years of DeMarcus Ware averaging about 17 sacks a season. So, yeah. Thank you, Captain Obvious, Brian Baldinger. You're 100% right. I've been screaming for it forever. People don't want to listen about a nose tackle. Thing is, he won't get any love. People won't buy his jersey. I will. I'm going to get a Mozzie Smith jersey. I had a John Ridgeway one, and unfortunately the Cowboys messed up, and now he's a commander. But I will wear that. John, if you're watching, John and your people, I will wear the John Ridgeway when we play you guys in Washington. I'll do that one. I'm an honor because that guy, that was a mistake for us to let that guy go. Anytime you get a guy who wants to bust some heads like crack some eggs, that's a guy you want on the defensive line. That's the mentality that you need. So you see the direct correlation because here's the thing. After Jay Ratcliffe left in 2012, that was his last year he played half of the year, DeMarcus Ware's numbers dropped 11.5 6.0 and um yeah and i think there's a direct correlation to having that pressure in the middle to the success on the outside so that's why i'm excited because the cowboys have tried everything everything you know you know we got we got uh edge rushers that can be tackles you know they're a tweener and you know a tackle anybody can play tackle no they can't no they can't you need a special individual who literally, the day after a game, every part of your body, parts that you didn't even know you had, hurt. It's unreal the amount of violence that goes on in this much space. The plays you get hit, and it is not for the faint of heart. If you really want to watch football, watch what happens on the line. Watch those guys. Everybody pays attention to the quarterback going back there, you know, and getting hit or the wide receiver. Cut. Watch the lines. I'm telling you, that's where the battles are really and truly won. So the big question, of course, now is who won the draft? You know, everybody's talking about the, the Bears and the Lions, you know, that they've done fantastic. And, of course, the Eagles, the Eagles, oh, they drafted so well and everything else. I kind of like being that sleeper team. I liked being that team that's the underdog that nobody thinks about. Let's listen to them to get up and, and get a little of their taste take this morning. Offensive football team that we've ever seen with Lamar in Baltimore. Number two, the Chicago Bears are coming. And shout out to the general manager, Ryan Pohl. Definitely and Aaron Rodgers. He has going. taken what I would have said was the worst situation for a quarterback to be in and made it much more solid. Their offensive line was terrible. Now they draft Darnell Wright. That's going to solidify that. They brought in Nate Davis. I love the addition of some of the perimeter players. Don't forget, DJ Moore was essentially part of this draft day as well. So Justin Fields is going to have the opportunity to stride. Mm -hmm. The Detroit Lions. Everyone is going to crown the Philadelphia Eagles as the best team in the NFC and then likely the 49ers. I would say that the Lions were big winners of the draft, and it's an unconventional way. Stop calling Jameer Gibbs a running back. They are going to use him like Devo Samuel. They are going to use him like Percy Harvin. They mm -hmm. solidified some of the needs that they needed and had in their football team. I love Sam Laporta, the tight end they got out of Iowa in the second round. This is a team that won eight out of her final ten games. And if you ask me who I thought would be the biggest threat to Philadelphia in a bona fide oh, Lord, NFC Championship contender... It is the Detroit Lions because of the draft that they Because he had. played there. I can tell you that Lewis Riddick... Homer! Lewis Riddick said exactly the same thing on our telecast <laughs> over the weekend. He thinks they will be an NFC Championship contender. A lot of people raise their eyebrows at the Lions draft, and I can see Graziano doing it over oh. here as well. It was unconventional, and I think that's a good way to put it. In the meantime, I don't know how we've come this far without my showing you this. Aaron Rodgers was here in town <laughs> this weekend. Uh, and I took winners and losers. Dan Orlovsky, who was your biggest winner from the weekend? Yeah, the Indianapolis Colts. They got a quarterback that is likely one of the most talented mm -hmm. physically that we have ever seen come into the NFL. Anthony Richardson, six foot four, two hundred forty mm -hmm. plus pounds, runs four four, very loose up top. Colts need a quarterback. They haven't had a quarterback Aaron since Andrew Stike Luck. Just did what he Their did. luck ran but out. Jalen Hurts. The future is very bright in Indianapolis. <laughs> Dan Graziano, give me a loser from the weekend. What about the Washington Commanders? There were 14 quarterbacks taken in this draft. Washington didn't take any of them. It's one thing to be all in on Sam Howell, but 
than not wow. hedge your bets at all against the possibility that he's not the long-term answer at quarterback. I, I think it was probably a mistake. Uh, they still have Jacoby Brissett on the roster. If Howell can't do it this year, but he's not the long-term answer either. I think still some questions remain at that position for Washington. Mike Tannenbaum, give me another loser from the weekend. Matt Jones, <laughs> while earlier in the offseason greedy, they added Juju Smith-Schuster, Mike Kosicki. This team desperately needed another weapon mm. or two, and they picked two receivers late in the sixth round, Keyshawn Booty and Demario Douglas. I wish they had got somebody much earlier, somebody that could have made a true difference this year for an offense that really needs to score a lot more points in 2023. And, and then the man who invented the draft, Mel Kuyper Jr., give us the biggest winner. The Eagles, of it's course. It's definitely the Philadelphia Eagles, Kareem. Everything fell right for the Eagles. They got great value based on my board. Jalen Carter, number one at nine. Nolan Smith, number 12 at 30. I'll tell you what, after that, Tyler Steen, the guard tackle from Alabama, heck of a player. Sidney Brown and Keely Ringo, two really good defensive backs. So they did a heck of a job. Value with every pick they selected. Yeah, there's no truth to the rumor they're going to change the name from Eagles to Bulldogs in Philadelphia because uh -huh. they basically just have the entire Georgia team. And why wouldn't you for the last couple of years? They've won back-to-back -back national championships. Look at the haul that the Eagles got this weekend, including the way they played the Jalen Carter move at the beginning. Many of us, myself included, thought was brilliant. They also draft Tyler Steen uh, from Alabama. They trade for DeAndre Swift. I mean, the Eagles, let, let me go to you, Orlovsky, on this, uh, because I know that your wife was enjoying watching it as much as anyone, the Philly fan that she is. It, it is my belief that the Eagles, who were already the best team in the NFC, they won the NFC Championship last year. They barely lost a game in which their quarterback was healthy the entire season. The, the Rich got much, much. Wait a minute. The Colts game? The Bears game? They lost to the Commanders here. Okay. I, I, okay. You know, I'm going to enjoy when the Eagles don't meet expectations this year. All right, good people. Time for me to go to work over here on the Red Brick House. And I um, hope to see you guys over there. Definitely check out my other channel, um, Joe Boo's Day Job, because Joe Boo, he's got a job. Most of the time it's in the day. Sometimes it's at night, too. Hope you have a great day, and I'll see you soon.